Morning. And he said last year it was a case of markets starting off the year by underestimating. Now we're overestimating price pressures. Why would you say that and how do you then adjust your portfolio to reflect that? Right. So I think the, the issue about overestimating the persistence of inflation just means that inflation is not going to stick around at current levels or even at very elevated levels over the course of this year. If you look at the various factors driving inflation, there is an underlying trend higher in, in you know, wages and you know, core services, which is moving higher. But it, there is a very large component coming from excess demand because of the stimulus immediately after the pandemic, which is going to roll off. Off. And then there are supply chain issues which are causing supply side inflationary pressures, which are also going to roll off. So if you look at this picture, inflation is going to start to significantly roll off into the second half of this year. Uh, and just as it is very typical with markets, markets tend to extrapolate what they're seeing in the near term well into the future. And I think that is what is happening right now. So coming into 2021, markets were underestimating inflation, and we were suggesting that markets should look otherwise. Uh, and coming into this year, it's the other way around. There are now uh, really modelling being done when it comes to what the impact of the Russian invasion in Ukraine will do to global GDP, will do to global inflation levels. Do you think we're underestimating the broader impact of that, that is beyond just being ring fenced to Europe? Yeah, so if you look at the impact uh, from uh, you know, this conflict in Ukraine uh, in, into global markets, there are four different channels, right? Firstly, it's uh, just the impact of fundamentals and economic impact uh, on global GDP. That we don't think is very large. Russia and Ukraine together make up less than 2% of global GDP and about 2% of the demand for various commodities and goods. Uh, then if you look at financial contagion channels, that's also quite limited outside of Europe. So especially in Asia and Japan, which is our region, uh, the linkages to Russia are really, really very minimal. Then you start to think about commodity prices as being the main channel uh, of impact in, in Asian markets. And we do think that commodity prices are going to remain elevated or, or you know, even in a structural super cycle in the case of oil. Uh, so that is going to remain the case, but that mm. is just not going to be sufficient to drive inflation overall uh, you know, significantly higher. If you look at US CPI energy, oil prices is just about 4% of that. Mixa, to your point, we are getting South Korea's vice finance minister speaking right now, saying that the Ukraine war impact on exporters and importers is now materializing. He's saying that there are some disruptions in grain shipments from Ukraine, also mentioning that they will strengthen FX liquidity management in financial companies, that they will swiftly take measures to stabilize markets if needed. Of course, Korea is one of those big oil importers across Asia, along with India. India, right as this graphics right now right. shows our viewers so what does that mean for their equity space because we are seeing outflows right now will this continue yeah, so India, Korea, and Philippines are the markets that are probably going to be most negatively impacted because of higher oil prices, given the way the current account dynamics work. Uh, you talked about grain prices and food prices. That is something that we do worry about. But again, uh, I think if you look at the, the connections between wheat prices and Asian food prices, that's actually slightly less because in Asia, the staple, uh, you know, the the consumption of carbs is via rice. It's not via wheat. So uh, if you look at that connection to Asian food prices, they tend to not move very much in line with European food prices. So uh, until we start to see supply disruptions in rice, uh, probably Asian food prices can continue to remain uh, relatively more stable. But of course, uh, Ukraine, Russia, both are very large exporters of wheat, of corn, of you know vegetable oils, which are going to put, put upward pressure on food prices overall. That's really interesting. What about those miners' energy stocks as well? Because we have seen this huge rally, for example, in oil prices over the past couple of years. We haven't seen that sort of a rally when it comes to energy stocks, for example. They've lagged uh, commodities prices. They have lagged commodity prices, but they are the best performing sector within mm. the equity market, right? Uh, so energy and financials are, are, are by far the leaders in terms of the last six months or last 12 months of performance within equity markets. Uh, so the way to think about this is that equity markets are discounting longer term prices of these commodities, right? And, and uh, the expectation is that the spike is somewhat transitory and it will come down to more normalized levels over time. Uh, and you could make a case that the oil prices in particular probably could sustain 
relatively higher compared to what markets are discounting, which is about 80 to 90 dollars per barrel. Uh, so there is upside to energy equities. If you look at our uh, overall recommendations right now, we tactically prefer a barbell of commodity stocks and oversold growth stocks. And mm. I think this really works very well in the context of what's happening in Ukraine, where we think the lasting impacts will be on commodity prices, and what's happening in terms of the Fed, where we think that the first chapter, where the Fed basically moves from easing or not tightening to tightening, that has come to an end. And with value stocks getting crowded by the middle of February, that is a bit of a consolidation phase for value here, and oversold growth stocks could do well for a while.